I'm delighted to be here today on this topic, and I'm particularly happy to welcome Rear Admiral Jonathan White. Um, he, uh, we're going to change gears a little bit. Uh, Rear Admiral White has many talents. He's a man of many talents, a man of many titles, more to the point. He's the navigator of the Navy. He's the oceanographer of the Navy. But the title that we're particularly going to lean on today is the Director of Task Force Climate Change. When the Navy decided in 2009 to create Task Force Climate Change, this wasn't about joining a political debate. It wasn't about the ethics or the morality of poverty versus climate change. And it wasn't um, about green and who's green and who's not. It was about the world the Navy operates in, the operating environment and the mission of the Navy and how this was affecting it. So what we're going to talk about today with Rear Admiral White, who's the director of this task force, is, uh, and, and by the way, also, he's, he owns the master clock and, and uh, uh, takes care of GPS for the Navy. So uh, if, you, if anybody knows where they are or when they are, it's because of this man. So um, what we're going to talk about is why the Navy is looking at this issue and how they're looking at it. Um, but let's start with the very first principles kind of uh, question, which is why the Navy? Um, why would the Navy be concerned about this? And there's, of course, other other uh, entities in the Department of Defense. Um, why has the Navy been so forward-leaning on climate change? So let me first just also offer a correction. It's, oh. I don't have that many talents. I have a lot of talented people <laughs> that surround me, so I'm hoping I can channel them while I'm, I'm on the stage uh, and their expertise. But no, thanks. Uh, the, so it sort of makes sense for the Navy to do this. When you think about the historical role of the U.S. Navy and even navies that came before us that we model ourselves afterward. Um, the British Navy, for example, you know, someone who changed science as we know it was a guy named Charles Darwin. He went to sea on a Royal Navy ship, the HMS Beagle. Uh, I think Navy, the U.S. Navy especially, has always looked to the future with an exploratory sense and really trying to understand what are the new frontiers. And when we look to the future, we understand our planet is changing. Uh, the cryosphere is shrinking. The ice is going away. The sea level is rising. Weather patterns are changing. And we're growing, for us, to a large degree, a new ocean uh, up around the North Pole. So if you look at this change, we n understand that we need to embrace it and navigate, as you put, our way ahead. And navigation requires making a decision. Where am I going to go? And so we understand that now is the time, as has been talked about, to make some decisions and take some action. So, and then the big part, why is, it, why is the Navy in the lead? Well, heck, you know, look at the panels that are here today, and what have you talked about? Sea level rise. Hmm, Navy ports. We have a lot of sea level, a lot of ports around the coastlines. Uh, I mentioned the Arctic Ocean perspective. So there are a lot of Navy-specific interest in what's happening to our planet. Uh, so that's, you know... The, it's a natural for the Navy. Yeah, sort of and and uh, this was, you know, the Chief of Naval <laughs> Operations yep. initiative. Um, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about that. You mentioned the cryosphere, which is, for anybody that doesn't know, is the world's ice. But there's a specific place that you mentioned, which is the Arctic. Um, let's talk a little bit about what the Navy is seeing there. Now, not what's being modeled or speculated about, but over the last decades, what the actual change that the Navy has seen through its imagery and other kinds of measurements that you take. Yeah, so I mean, if you look and you know, you can, everybody's seen um, the reports in the National Snow and Ice Data Center on, you know, the amount of, of the ice minimum is shrinking. We follow those. We understand that is fact, that is based on satellite observations. The models that show the volume of ice shrinking are also based largely on fact. It's the area along with ice cores and you get a volume. And then the other thing that we've observed is we have, we've been sending submarines north in the Arctic for decades now. The reports back from the submarine tell us it's a lot different now. Our captains who are going uh, into the Arctic on submarines, when they went to sea as a lieutenant 20 years ago, you know, it was a lot different north of the Bering Strait this time of year before. You know, the ice is thinner. It's much more dynamic and things like that. So we see, we see change occurring. We see, of course, the longer ice-free seasons where we always had multi-year thick pack ice. Now it's seasonal one-year ice or sometimes very short periods of ice. So we, so, so we are seeing that, and then based on that, we're trying to, we are projecting uh, a future that's going to be much more open for periods of the year. 
also an Arctic that's going to be much more dynamic in terms of what happens with the ice as well, and knowing that we likely will have to be, ab be able to operate up there. So, and you have, I know you have a, an Arctic roadmap that's, yep. that's helping to chart for the Navy where you need to go. What are some of the equipping challenges? You know, so again, let's just talk brass tacks. Sure. When the Navy's looking at, we're going to be operating up there and it's going to be an entirely new ocean. We will not be the only country up there. We are not the only country sure. up there. What does the Navy actually, what are you worried about? Where do you see the potential investments? Well, the first is, if you are going to go anywhere on any ocean, I want to be able to do it safely. Uh, so regardless of whether of what type of ship I may operate up there, uh, the Navy, as I mentioned, we operate submarines up there today. We understand how to do that. Uh, I don't see that changing a lot. It's really our surface ships, our aircraft, and our people, and maybe infrastructure. These are the things that we start to look for. In order to do all that, you, you want to be able to, you, you've got to be able to, uh, to actually operate safely. And every ship captain in the Navy will tell me, as an oceanographer and meteorologist, if I'm going to take my ship up there, John, you better be able to tell me what the weather, the ice, the ocean is doing. And also, your charts, your nautical charts for navigation better be accurate. And so those are challenges. We don't have a lot of those things up in the Arctic today. And so that's the first thing we've got to do is, and we are, in, we are actually investing a lot of money, several million dollars a year in the Navy to do, to do research to understand the environment, be able to forecast the environmental conditions. And then we've got to work, and you mentioned other nations up there. These aren't just our challenges. We've got the Arctic Council, of which everyone knows we're going to be in the chairmanship role here in a couple of months. And as we take on that, I think the opportunity of the nations to work together to answer these common problems. If I'm going to do search and rescue, which we've agreed to do, how do I partner to do a better job of predicting where the hazardous areas are, what the ice is doing, what the weather is doing, and then also can we start to chart the ocean in some areas that used to be always I ice covered? Can we share data to produce some, uh, some areas safe for navigation? So those are the key enablers, but then I'm also looking at what ships I'm going to build in the future. I've got to make some hard decisions. Just like we talked about hard decisions in relation to sea level rise, you know, when am I going to invest in things and in, in doing things differently or how I build my structure? When am I going to invest in maybe ships that are more ice capable than they are today? So there are some hard investment decisions that we're going to have to make in the not too distant future to have a Navy that's by the mid 20s to 2030 is already capable. So that's when you see that it, yep. there'll be a mission for the Navy. The, the Coast Guard right now is, uh, as far as you've seen an increase in mm -hmm. civilian traffic through yep. the area, um, particularly for, I would imagine, oil and gas uh, related, but also just pleasure trips through the area. Um, and that's fishing a search as well. and rescue yeah. challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but, but so far, as far as a naval mission, you're looking at 2030 or so. Yeah, and it's really, we, we have missions in every ocean. Uh, on the world today, you, you want your Navy to be able to go on every ocean. We don't anticipate any kind of conflict in, in the Arctic, so I was we're, we're say, not looking for that. People talk about a race there. Do you think that's yeah, realistic? Yeah, I don't see it's a race. I just see it as, the, as this ocean becomes more navigable. We don't want to have an ocean that we say, I can't go there. So if I'm going to be able to go there, we are looking, we're sort of looking at 2025 to 2030, that time frame where you're going to see for at least a few weeks a year on, you know, some years more than other, some open transit passages near polar routes, deep water passage routes during the summertime only, of course. And as you start to see that, that's going to provide you, we're going to see that traffic that you talked about. And we're seeing a linear increase in traffic going through the Bering Strait and going across. Uh, you can look in the Barents Sea over by Norway. They say it's greater than linear increase in cruise ships and fishing and things like that. But it's not an exponential increase yet. But So if you sort of chart that out, you start to say, yeah, mid-20s time frame is a good target to say, okay, I need to have a minimally capable Navy. Well, we're, we're, we're minimally capable today. I need to have a more capable Navy by the mid-20s. And by 2030, I ought to have a Navy that can do pretty much every mission the Navy has to do up in the Arctic. And, and that's a reasonable planning horizon for exactly. the Navy, the, where you're making those plans and investments yeah. now. And again, we rely a lot on the expertise of a lot of folks that are in this room and beyond, uh, but, you know, from NOAA to a lot of the universities, a lot of the people who really try to predict, project long-term what the ice is doing, and we've put those together to come up with that estimate that you can find in our roadmap. And so for, as far as that being a mission and the research you're doing and the investments you're laying in, um, there are other Navy, core Navy missions mm -hmm. that, that are being affected by climate change. Yeah. 
And one of those is humanitarian and disaster relief. I saw a number the other day that Pacific Command, which is based out in Hawaii, is estimates that they're doing at least one humanitarian mission every eight weeks. And so they're seeing an increase in the tempo of that kind of operation. And when you and I talked about this earlier, one of the things you said that really struck me is, yes, this is a mission that the Navy has had for a long time. It's in the Navy's strategy, definitionally a core mission of the Navy. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's increasing. But the real challenge is not so much the relief, but prevention yeah. and resilience. And yeah. I thought that was a fascinating point. Yeah, and I think that's, and like I, I try to say, we have this term in DOD when we plan humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, HADR is the term that we use for those missions. I think when can we start to use the vernacular of HADP, humanitarian assistance and disaster prevention? And this comes in a couple of ways. First of all, where are the most vulnerable areas to catastrophic weather events? Now, earthquakes and tsunamis, uh, you know, we're a long way away from being able to project some of those issues. We can understand where the vulnerable areas are, but we can do a much better job of based on sea level rise, based on uh, the seasonal, annual, and maybe even the decadal weather patterns, climate patterns. Can we understand where some of the vulnerable areas around the world might be? And what's going on with the population, the coastal populations. And as we see areas that we know are extremely vulnerable to typhoons, um, to flooding from monsoon, rainal flow, glaciers melting, those kind of things, can we get in there and help what was talked about to sort of partner and make some of our, some of our partner nations less vulnerable to some of these climate change related events? Can we go in there like we've done for a long time? You know, we send a lot, we send doctors, we send people to work with, we do outrage engagement with State Department. Is there a way to maybe do a little bit more in terms of those that are willing and those that we have access to, can we partner with them to maybe do a little bit more prevention so when the catastrophic things happen, the relief is not quite, uh, not quite as severe? No, I, and, I, and the Navy's already started yep. incorporating that into the way it does sure. business. It's, um, and of course, it's not just about partner nations and, and a strategic engagement or even an operational yep. one, so meaning that the Navy has to do these operations. It's also a self-interested one because uh, the disasters sometimes are in, in our own countries, in our own bases. So we were talking about, you, you mentioned coastal infrastructure. Um, so part of the mission for Task Force Climate Change is looking at the Navy's own infrastructure mm -hmm. and how to prepare that. Now, is that a real concern? Like, you know, we, you mentioned Norfolk uh, the other day. Is it a real concern for Norfolk? Is this something you're actually seeing uh, already as a challenge? Oh, it most certainly is, you know. And we sort of have uh, this mixed blessing in the Navy, you know. And it wasn't even mixed when I came into the Navy. We have the best bases in the entire country, if not world, you know. Places like San Diego, Norfolk, Virginia, Annapolis, coastal, Honolulu. We used to have a base in Bermuda, but you know, unfortunately shut that down. But uh, one thing they have in common there, they're all right next to the ocean. Uh, so this thing called, we, as we understood, the climate change in the 80s, 90s, and now you know, we're faced with what we have. We understand, especially on the east coast of the US, where you have sea level rise, we see it happening where you have, another thing that's happening is uh, thanks to, you know, our plate tectonics, the continental plate that we reside on is subsiding in the eastern coastline. So about the same rate that sea level is rising for the Hampton Roads area, it is actually subsiding. So it's millimeters per year, but that adds up over time. So if you go look at the number of flooding events in the Norfolk, Virginia area over the last few decades, you can see, and you can go on, the, it has increases. You can talk to people who've lived there and say, yeah, it wasn't like this in the 50s, you know. So, you know, so as we see that, we say, okay, we've got a Navy base there. And if you see, look at an aerial picture of the Naval Base Norfolk, the largest Navy base in the country, if not world, it looks like an island. It's like, you know, and, you know, you got a little isthmus that connects it. So it's almost like a peninsula. It's surrounded by water, and we see more and more flooding events. Well, if we're going to keep that Navy base with all the infrastructure, with the power of the water and things like that, and keep it viable. Yeah, we can raise the piers, we can do our own Navy stuff, but there's this other thing. Our sailors tend to live out in town. Uh, they tend to send their kids to schools that are in town. We don't make our, all of our own power. Uh, we don't plug our nuclear submarines into the grid. We don't Not have, usually, anyway. We don't have solar cells yet on base to solve all of our prob power problems. So 
we rely on the infrastructure of our local. And that's why you, you take a look at Norfolk. It's a great example. And it's been, uh, it's been called out as a pilot project by the, the White House, the National S Security Staff. And they're asking for DOD to take a lead in this one because we recognize that we're trying to help bring the local community and also the state, the local governments. And it's a bipartisan effort right now to figure out a long-term plan for how to deal with sea level rise in the Hampton Roads area. And so we're very excited about that and maybe using that as an example. But that's why we're really concerned about our own infrastructure. Somewhat of a long-winded answer, but yes, we're very no, concerned. No, and we, we have to do something. It's, you know, and you can argue about, okay, why and what's causing it. Yes, in the Navy, you know, I believe that uh, there is something we need to take measures in mitigation. We are doing that as a byproduct of some of our efforts uh, to get away from fossil fuels, also to increase our security um, posture there as well. But, you know, we've got to understand it is happening and how are we going to adapt uh, in those important coastal areas. The, the public-private element of that is really interesting. I, mean, I think there's a long tradition of that in the military that, that, the, that you integrate with the community around you in ways that are consequential. And in this case, as far as solving the problem or mitigating the problem, um, you're working with, you said, Old Dominion. You mentioned the other day to me, you know, Representative Forbes, yeah. who I've had personal um, experience yeah. with. And uh, when it comes down to something like this, it's not about politics. It's about the fact that you showed me a graph where the incidence of flooding in Norfolk is on a straight, you know, trend up. And it's also the frequency, the severity, all of it. That's inescapable. It's not a debating point. It's happening. Yeah. And I think that's, it's a, yeah, for us in the Navy, it's a matter of fact. And how do you deal with it? And that's what we've got to do based on, you know, based on what we know and what we see, just like we deal with other hazards in the Navy. But it also creates, you know, this is, so this is, now it's an opportunity to do something about it. So we're trying to, at that point where we have an opportunity before it gets to be a crisis or before we're responding to more crisis, how can we, uh, there are great opportunities to figure out solutions to this. And so that's what we're trying to do in Norfolk. And we'll take a look at other places that are also vulnerable, like Annapolis and others. And we're going to have to do similar type as, uh, types of efforts there, I believe, in the coming years. And some of this, it's not necessarily a huge amount of spending, right? I mean, sometimes it's, it's a matter of building codes. It is. And it's building codes. And it's also understanding priorities. And sometimes it's a matter of, you know, I know I've got to replace this roadway. It was budgeted three years ago to replace this roadway in a city's budget. Oh, uh, yeah, it connects to the interstate over there, you know, and that's somebody else's problem. But, uh, you know, and they're going to replace it the next year. Well, in your budget to, rep to basically replace this road, did you think about raising it maybe a meter? Well, yeah, we thought about that, but, you know, just didn't have the money. And by the way, well, if I raise this road, what about the, s the interstate that's federally state funded? Are they doing the same thing, you know? You've got to get everybody together. We're st I think we're still at a point... We're sort of, we've been playing little kid soccer for a long time. Everybody's got their own little, sometimes their own soccer ball, and they're sort of running all over the place. And we're starting to graduate a little bit toward middle school, maybe, approach. And, uh, you know, we're starting to play more of the team. That's what we, 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 we want to get to the World Cup level of, okay, you know, everybody together, let's focus on how to, how to improve it. And I think, yeah, you're right. If you do it now, uh, it's, you know, it's actually less expensive. The longer th that you wait, the more expensive it becomes because in the harder type of decisions and you're having to deal with more, you're much more closest, closer to if not responding to a crisis. And that's that not just in terms of building codes, but where you're putting neighborhoods, where you're building. And at some point we may have to address issues in a lot of areas around our coastlines. I think we're going to have to, personal opinion. Where do we displace neighborhoods to? Making the hard decisions. That's opportunities for, you know, we've got to get the lawyers involved now, maybe even the psychotherapists involved now, but of making those kind of, of decisions up front and planning for that, you know. How do you do it in a way where somebody doesn't feel like, uh, you know, I used to have this beautiful home that's right on the Chesapeake and, you know, now you're telling me I've got to leave. Well, you know, how do you partner and do that as sort of um, a team approach instead of, you know, basically coming in and say that's my land and yours is now over there. We don't want to do that. So it's... Challenges, challenges and opportunities. And I think um, one of the things that really struck me about the Navy's efforts in task force climate change was that, you know, it's about managing your own infrastructure. It's about managing your partnerships. Mm -hmm. It's about managing the change that's actually happening in places like the Arctic. But the other part of it that's a little more unusual, I think, I in my experience from the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. is that you're also looking at your planning and strategy for the future. So again, how the Defense Department works is that there's thinking going on all the time 
that is you know, a year in the future, five years in the future, 10 years, sometimes 40 years, because it takes a long time to build capacity in this system. And that the Navy really was forward leaning about bringing these considerations into that planning cycle and thinking about what's the future world going to look like and what kind of Navy do we need. Um, how is, you know, is, that, is that a fair observation that right. that's been part of your efforts? Absolutely. Uh, the best example I can tell you of that is so uh, every couple of years we have what we uh, call the International Sea Power Symposium. Uh, where our Chief of Naval Operations, Al McGreener, invites his counterparts from around the world. We had, uh, back in October, 70 Chiefs of Navy from around the world, nations like Nigeria and many others, they sent their head, head Naval officer uh, to come to Newport, Rhode Island, and have conversations about many issues, navigation, working together, and sea, and c communicating, all these things. We spent uh, over half a day on climate change. And I'll tell you, hearing from the international Navy community, naval community on climate change uh, was amazing. Uh, and I think it's not just the U.S. Navy, but a lot of other navies because of their coastal maritime focus are seeing this. So I think it, uh, it really has been. And yes, so we've, as we look long at the future, uh, just like we looked at the future of a nuclear navy, the future of a carrier navy in the past, we've got to look at the future of a navy that is addressing climate change and, like I said, growing a new ocean. So certainly it's part of our, our strategic planning. I think we have time for just a couple questions. Um, so if you would say, please identify yourself and do, do try to ask a question. <laughs> um, and I, I'm a very rude person, so don't be uh, sad if I cut you off. Yeah, she is, I can attest to that. She, yeah. <laughs> Back when she worked Thank in the you. Pentagon anyway. Yes, I was very rude <laughs> all the time. <laughs> just kidding. Dan Sarah, Sarah from State University. Um, I, I have a, a very focused, concrete question about awesome. how we use the Navy's highly pragmatic, very depoliticized approach to this uh, as a model for broader action across society. Um, you guys have to attend to your own business, but those of us on the outside who are trying to get past the political mess yeah. um, would love to think of DOD as a kind of exemplar uh, for how to take this pragmatic approach. Do you have very concrete suggestions for how those of us on the outside can actually collaborate? Is it possible? Um, with the Navy uh, in getting this message and model out to the world? Yes, um, it, it is. And I would encourage you to, you know, start conversations with the Navy, with the other services. The Navy's not alone. I will tell you that just like all the other parts of our society, there are Naval officers, you know, who think that, you know, John White's been smoking something he's not <laughs> supposed to be smoking with this climate change thing. But, uh, but yes, you, but the more and more as time goes on, we're much more pragmatic. We depoliticize everything, as you know. The other in my mind, the big part of the U.S. infrastructure that can depoliticize things are the, all, all, all of the academic institutions, largely. Get away from the politics. We tried. I don't think so, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 you, you said from, from you where You do research, on. right? Yeah. You do research But the research that is done, yeah. the partnering that happens between some of the universities and some of our defense and laboratories, what are those opportunities? Like Old Dominion, you said, like was Old a Dominion partner I talked about, at Norfolk. Uh, and, and with UC San Diego Scripps Institution, I was at Ohio State University. I didn't root for them to win the football game, by the way. <laughs> but uh, this is back earlier in the year. They're looking at, the, they've been a polar center for a long time. Time. So I think building those partnerships between not just DOD but other agencies as well. But yes, I think we do bring something. The folks in uniform largely are seen as apolitical. So I think at least I know on the Navy there are several folks who would be happy to have that conversation with the ac academic institutions and others about you know how can we come to some common ground and how can we solve some of these um, polar issues that we have. I think, and I think the key there is it's common ground. It's, you know, the Navy's solving its own problems and the nation's problems in doing this. So if you want them to come and have, uh, you know, join the political debate on campus about is climate change happening or not, they're not really the right institution. But if you want to partner with them on research, uh, you know, on, like with Ohio State, that's, or even if there's a base in your community, again, there's a high degree of engagement and the Norfolk Project's a perfect example where it involves every element of civil society in that region, and the Navy's at the heart of it. So I, I think it's a great model, too, that it's, it's oriented at what's the problem you're solving for. Yeah. And in this case, it's the Navy's operations, and its, and its needs to be able to operate globally and to respond to certain kinds of missions. Yeah. And I think that's a good model for everybody to take away, too, which is what problem are you solving for, and how do you get there? 
It's a, but it's, it, it's also, don't forget, there's a leadership opportunity, a leadership challenge here. We were gifted with the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Gary Roughhead, followed by Admiral John Greener, who understand this. We have a Secretary of Defense, Hagel, who's also uh, talked very strongly about our defense planning for climate change. We have a four-star Admiral, Sam Locklear, the head of the U.S. Pacific Command out in Hawaii, as you mentioned, has been there for about three years now. He says climate change is his number one strategic long-term priority and problem that he's looking at the entire Pacific and Indian Ocean realm. So senior leadership and advocacy is very important, and I think we're happy to, to take those conversations uh, to other realms if so, and reach out as necessary to do the things she talked about. Okay, just one more. So if someone has a great question, okay, we nominate you. I hope it's not any harder. Paul <laughs> from the University of Toronto. Um, you spoke uh, at length and very well on the Arctic. Yeah. Clearly, the Navy has other challenges about expensive infrastructure uh, along yeah. coasts, uh, a mission about search and rescue, um, naval operations in storms, disaster relief and recovery. Could you comment a bit on, on what priority that's given vis-a-vis -vis the Arctic? And, and indeed, if you have any ideas of rough uh, span? Yeah. Uh, in the uh, period you're talking about, you're saying investment priorities. Well, investment priorities, yeah. uh, but also changes in the mission because the shipwrecks will be worse, the disasters will be more frequent, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, so that's and that's one of the, one of the big challenges that, that that we have not now. Our priorities in mission, you know, the, you know, we're all you know, the Navy's priority is war fighting and national defense, and that is what we have to focus on. Uh, so as we face threats, especially in the maritime or where our maritime operations, we have to focus, and that's always going to be our near-term priority. But as we look at other things that we can do in the future, things that are smart, as I talked about, if we're building new buildings, building new ships, making the right decision. So in order, I would have to say that right now, related to the climate change things, the Arctic being as it's a, a new ocean uh, and it's a, a new theater is probably our top priority right under it is what we're doing about our coastal infrastructure and partner with others uh, because of the, the sea level rise. I think those are sort of one and two and close third is then okay how can we as a Navy working amongst all the other national and international agencies and efforts get after some of the problems that the previous panel talked about in terms of addressing whether it's energy or adaptation especially. Uh, how can we help uh, make our world more climate ready as well as weather ready in the future. So it's, it's almost not just how much do you spend on this, but everything you're spending, how do you spend it? And, and do you take it into account? Yeah. That's so a great way to put it, and that's how some of the smart folks like yourself and OSD have put that in the past. Thanks. Don't spend foolishly when you're going to spend. And just in about case you all wonder, it's really common for someone from a military service to compliment a civilian from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So. <laughs> So That's remember right. that you heard, you heard it. Right. I, I want to thank Red Malay. And in case also you don't realize, uh, you know, he mentioned that the Navy has great leadership. You don't get to two stars easily and for nothing. So this gentleman is one of the great leaders of the Navy. And uh, you can see why. Uh, we're lucky to have him here today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.